This is the first Sunday since Before we start, I just want to share meditation which is when I was preparing for worship leading the Sunday that this song came to me day by day. It is a Swedish hymn written by Carolina on Lina Sandover. The music was composed by Oscar and Fell in 1865. Lina is also known as the Penny Crossy of Sweden. I'm not going to ask you to sing. She wrote this song after she experienced a very traumatic experience when she saw her father, a pastor, drown while traveling across one of the lakes in Sweden. Day by day. I will play the music, but I will read the words from the song. Day by day. And with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my father's wise discernment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure, leads unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, heart of pain and pleasure, mingling for peace and rest. Help me then in every tribulation. So trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith, sweet consolation. Offer me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meet me. Ever to take as from a father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments, fleeting, till I reach the promised land. The words of this tradition are very beautiful, and I think some of us can relate to it. And if you see this in the front of your bulletin, even when I do not understand, I will praise you. And this is a very important statement and this is something which personally I have experienced. And even when I do not understand, I choose to praise God. I choose to believe that God is good. I choose to believe that the God we worship is a faithful God. So we have to make the decision that even when I do not understand, I will praise you. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us say together the opening prayer. Everlasting God, our Father in heaven, your faithfulness sustains us, your loving kindness refreshes us, your fatherly goodness guides us on. Where do we turn to if not you? We turn to you, O Lord, we trust you. We trust you that we raise our voices and sacrifice our praise to you as we do so. May our will be set more and more in Christ our Lord. Let us sing together the theme of praise, all oh, for a heart to praise my God.
the safety together, the prayer of illumination. Lord, your word is the food that nourishes and sustains us through our lives. Your word is the light that illumines us in confusing times. Please speak that we may listen, that we be nourished and enlightened. To Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is written from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 13, chapter 2, verse 3. Verse 13. Your eyes are pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked follow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked fool pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net, he gathers them up in his dread net, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense. For by his neck he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he going to keep on emptying his neck, destroying nations without mercy? I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to this Sorry, I missed one first verse. So I will be so quiet. Okay, for verse 3, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. This is the word of the Lord. Our theme of preparation is Teach me in thy way, O Lord.
morning. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to that secret judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his red net. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his red net. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Habakkuk 1, chapter 1, we remember Habakkuk said, how long more is he to see all the wrongdoing continually? Will God not save his people? Will God not bring about another revival to, like King Josiah did? Is God not going to do anything? And God replied, God says, yes, I am going to do something in your time. I'm going to send Babylonians. They're coming very fast. They're coming very swift. They are coming because God sent them to discipline God's people. Habakkuk was hoping that God would respond to his cries by saving the Israelites, but God's reply to him must have stunned him or at least took him by surprise when God said he was sending the Babylonians to discipline his own chosen people. Why would Habakkuk be perplexed? Why would Habakkuk be stunned? Habakkuk said, I don't understand. I don't understand. Yes, we, your people, have sinned. Judah has sinned. Israelites have sinned. Yes, they have sinned against you, but surely you got, you're going to send somebody holy, somebody who's better than us to come and discipline us. Surely you're going to send somebody who is not as sinful as Judah to discipline, because the Babylonians are not holy people. They are not sinners. They are not righteous. God, I don't understand. How can you send somebody godless, somebody more sinful than us, to come and discipline us? That was Habakkuk's perplexity. I don't understand God. Are you not everlasting? You were there. You were the one who took the initiative in our lives. You were the one who called our forefather Abraham. You were the one who said that we are going to be as many as the stars in the skies and as many as the sands on the seashore. You are, didn't you say that you, know, you have made a covenant with us? You were everlasting. You were there at the beginning. And then you journey with us. And then you promised to be with us. You said you made an everlasting covenant with us. You are everlasting. You have not just appeared today. You are everlasting. And you are holy. You are perfect. And you say you tolerate no sin or wrong. So now how can we understand this? That you are sending the Babylonians, the godless, the ruthless, the immoral ones to come and discipline us, your chosen people. I don't understand God. You are powerful. You are the one who is in charge. You decide on this and you decide on that. And surely you can take, you can better 
you can better take charge of the situation. Why do you allow the ruthless, the immoral Babylonian to be taking the center stage? Why do you appoint the violent, the heathen, those who do not worship you to punish your own chosen people? I'm paraphrasing Habakkuk chapter 12, uh, chapter 2, sorry, chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Habakkuk could not understand. I don't understand why are you doing this. Because all that you are doing seems not to agree with your holiness. It does not seem to agree with what we believe that you are. Because you don't tolerate evil and sin. So why have you sent Babylonians, the ruthless, the merciless, to come and discipline your people? Habakkuk's complaint we can understand. And his complaint at times is our complaint too. We are trying to do something good in our school, Lord, don't you see? We are trying to do something good in our family, God. We are trying to do something good in our church, God. But why is it that you allow the seemingly godless people to come and disrupt our work? I don't understand. At different times in our lives too, we face times in our lives when we can't understand why evil seems to be having the center stage. Why things don't go well when we seek to do our best to honor God. Why those who are dishonest are rewarded and those of us, yes, we are not perfect, but we are diligent. And we seek to be honest, we are maligned and we are marginalized. But the dishonest seem to be rewarded and put in the center stage. Have you experienced that? Maybe most of you are luckier than I. I use the word lucky. A complaint that focuses on oneself or one's problem leads one to demoralization and frustration. I went through that. When I focus on my problems and focus on what I think, every day I get up feeling so demoralized and so frustrated. When I focus on what I see to be not right, I just felt, I'm just so tired. I cannot carry on, God. Where is all this taking me? You don't seem to be punishing the, the one who is not right. You know? You just feel so tired in Fuchang, we say Ka chiu le le song, you know, hands tired, legs tired, ling ping liao, mai zhou liao, you know. When I focus on my thoughts and my problems, it leads me to daily tiredness and frustration, demoralization, and the temptation to give up is very real. But brothers and sisters, this morning when we look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12, verses 12 to verses 12 to 13, we are going to see that Habakkuk's complaint is not invalid. His observation is not invalid. He is looking at the Babylonians, the ruthless, the merciless the godless people coming to discipline God's people. But if he were to stop there, he is going to be very demoralized. We look at Habakkuk, his complaint rested upon what he knows of God. And that makes his complaint one that speaks of Habakkuk, not in a denial mode. He acknowledges the true predicament that he was faced with, and he did so based upon the truth of who God is, so that he can carry on. Habakkuk's complaint is made against the truth of who God is, that God is the everlasting one, that God is the holy one, that God is the sovereign one, that God is the rock, the faithful, 
and the reliable one. So God, Habakkuk said, Lord, are you not from everlasting? You see, his complaint intermingles with the truth of who he knows God is. Are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? You will never die. What is also said that he's everlasting, he's always having the last word. And this time he is not also he is also going to have the last word. You Lord have appointed them to execute judgment. God is in charge. You, my rock, the reliable one, the faithful one, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. I can't understand what's going on, but God, I know you are everlasting. I can't understand what is going on, but you are my God, my Holy One, and you will never die. I can't understand God, but I know that you are the one who have appointed the Babylonians to execute judgment. I can't understand, but I know that you are the reliable one, and it is you who have ordained them to punish. And I know that your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. I can't understand, but they, the truth about who you are. There is place for complaints in our lives, brothers and sisters. Sometimes, Christians try to be stoic. We think that all these problems, you know, we quickly brush away problems that face us. We are not called to be stoic. We are called to be people who live facing the realities of our lives, but in the light of a greater reality of who God is, who our God is. When we are able to hold on to the truth of who God is, then we, like Habakkuk, in chapter 2, verse 1, will be able to stand and watch. Stand and watch. Not give up. Not resign. Not throw away. But we will stand and watch. We will not become neglectful. We will not become those who cannot beat the crowd, we join the crowd. But we will stand and watch. Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch. I will stand at my watch reminds us of those ancient days where at the where at the city, city gate, there will be this watch tower. And this this guard, this tower watch guard will always look up, waiting because they take turns to watch. They will watch for morning to come, they step down, somebody else will take over, and they will watch for enemies that are coming. He said, I will stand at my watch. He speaks of his duty like a guard, like a watch guard. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the rampart. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Remembering God's truth enables us to stand, take our station, each of us our station, to stand and watch, not become neglectful, but continue to do the duty of a watchman, staying awake and watch. Standing above the rest, more often than not, the tower, the watchtower is higher than the rest of the city because you need to be able to see. And this is where I'm going to suggest to us sometimes our problems and the things that we are faced with makes us feel as if we are being swallowed up, you know, we are consumed by it. But the word that Hapakot used here, stand and watch, gives us that we do good to ponder upon. It is not good to continue to be wallow, to be wallowing in the questions that we have no answer. But we need to rise above. 
these issues that we cannot understand. And we do that because of who God is. We stand above the problem because we stand upon the truth of who God is. That He is everlasting, that He is holy, He is sovereign, He is faithful. And on that tower, we stand and watch. We don't allow our thoughts to be drifted away by questions we have no answer. When we are faced with questions we have no answer, we stand upon the truth of the Lord, our rock, so that we may continue to stand and watch. So in that way, we are detached. Detached as in, we are not allowing our questions to swallow us up, but we stand away, we stand upon the truth of who God is. Remain faithful. We pray and we don't worry. We petition to God our concern and we don't be anxious. That is standing and watch. Thirdly, Habakkuk. Habakkuk says he will look and see what he will say and what answer I am to give to his complaint. Habakkuk will need to wait. Stand, watch and wait. And expect God to speak for God will speak. Many doubted God when we are faced with problems, we give up believing God. Many give up believing and trusting God when problems come against us. Many walked away from God. Many give up coming to church. Many give up serving God. Many pastors will come. Many church leaders also walk away. Many leaders also stop serving God. But Habakkuk account and passage tells us, encourages us, that when we are faced with issues we can't understand, when we are faced with questions that have no easy and quick answers, we must not be driven by our questions that have no easy and quick answer. On the contrary, we hold on to the truth of who God is. Stand upon these truths and watch. Stand firm as St. Paul exhorts the Christians in Ephesians that our battle is not against the flesh and the blood. It's against the principalities of things unseen. So what do we do? We put on the armor of God and we stand firm. We stand firm. And we wait for the Lord to speak or answer. Waiting speaks of a humble posture. Waiting makes us humble. Waiting makes me humble. And be willing to wait. And in our journey and journey of faith with God, it is important for us to cultivate a listening posture while we wait for God to speak. So we sing the hymn, Teach me, O Lord. Did God speak? God spoke. He did. We have a glimpse of it to in today's passage, chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not wait. It will come. God spoke. God reveals. 
God will make what He is doing clear. God unfolds His plan, and at the end of it, we will know that God is still the everlasting God. God reveals. God unfolds His plan in His time, the Kairos time, the appointed time. Never too late, never too early. It will be according to God's appointed time. That's all. To grow into learning, learning to stand, watch, and wait. And let God be God in our lives, in all that He has called us. There is an account in the New Testament that tells us about the appointed time, and in this story, we also get to see ourselves in the in this account about we trying to understand things according to our thoughts, and we try to tell God what to do a lot of times. And I thought that account is found in John chapter 11, a story of how Lazarus was raised to life again. If you would turn with me to the scripture, John chapter 11. John chapter 11 records for us. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick. Was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with his hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now that's what the Lord says. Verse five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. <laughs> you can't understand, right? You know that he is where he loved them. That that's how John wrote it. You know, he loved Mary and Martha, and he knew that the brother was sick, and then he somehow stayed two more days. You cannot understand. Ah,、uh, what, what's going on here? You know. And then he said to his disciples. Let's go back to Judea, verse eight. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. Human thinking. No, no, no. You're not going back there because the people there are trying to kill you. You don't go back there.、Yeah. Verse nine. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble. For they see by the world's light. <clears throat> Mystical, yeah. The Lord is saying that we need to look at things from God's perspective. Verse ten. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, "Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep." But I am going there to wake him up. Verse twelve. His disciples replied, "Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better." When I read this, I said, "Wow!、Well, so many times I make decisions for God, you know, and pretend that I speak on behalf of God." But that's not what God is saying. That's not what Jesus is saying, you know. Verse thirteen. Jesus had been speaking of his death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. This is a good story that tells us so many times we try to understand things from God's perspective. So many times we try to defend God, even yeah, and so many times we try to speak what God is not saying. So, so then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am going. I am glad I was not going there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Verse sixteen. Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, "Let us also go, 
that we may die with him. Oftentimes we also make very stout, you know, pledges, yeah, for God, yeah. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. That reminds me so often, I try to tell God what to do. I know this, but you must do that. I know that, but you must do this. <laughs> Verse 24, Martha answered, sorry, verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And look at this exchange between Martha and Jesus, very interesting. Yeah? Sometimes when we look at this, it's like a mirror, you know? it's true that God's word is like a mirror for us, a reflection. I know that you, first in verse 22, Martha said, I know God will give you whatever you ask. Then Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Then Martha answered in verse 24, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? 27, yes Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. You think Martha believed in Jesus? Verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at a place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with Mary, in the house, comforting her. Notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? You see the question? You have done this now. Why didn't you do this? Go your forsake us now. You know, save us now from these greedy politicians, you know. Just wipe them out. Just move your hand and they will all die, you know. Sometimes I feel like telling God that, right? Ah, yeah, God, if you can make this man, blind man see, uh, you could have kept this man from dying. Verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance, it's away the stone, he said. My Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? You must see what you want to see. You must see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes. I 
I'd like to stop my sermon here because it's very difficult when you're staying on here. You're all falling asleep with a mask on and all, yeah? Let me encourage you to go back and read the story again so that we may understand. Lord, I don't understand. But teach me so that I may see your glory. Somebody put this account, John chapter 11, into a lovely song. Let me go back and Google it. I sent it to you in one of my end of day notes during the MCO. The song is entitled Four Days Late, if you remember. It's a glorious song. Yeah? Um, and the lyrics of the song says, The news came to Jesus. Please come fast. Lazarus is sick. And without your help, he will not last. Mary and Martha watched their brother die. They waited for Jesus. He did not come. And they wondered why. The death watch was over. Buried four days. Somebody said he will soon be here. The Lord's on his way. Mother ran to him and then she cried, Lord, if you had been here, you could have healed him. He will still be alive. But... You are four days late and all hope is gone. Lord, we don't understand why you have waited so long. But his way is God's way, not yours or mine. When he is four days late, he is still on time. Google the song and be blessed by it. Brothers and sisters, I don't think God is interested in me doing great things. I don't think God expects me to be a successful pastor. I don't think God expects me to be a great preacher. I don't think God expects me to grow a fast growing church. But I think God is interested in me, learning to become a person who walks out there so that His glory may be seen. Who do you worship? What do you know about this person whom you worship? He alone is God. He is everlasting, holy, powerful. He is in charge. He is faithful. There will be questions we don't have answered. There are many perplexities that we have to face. But we must hold on to the truth of who is God in God is, who is the tower upon which we stand and watch. And He will reveal, He will reveal His glorious work and power. But would you be there when He reveals and unfolds? Would you be there standing? Illumine our mind of who you are, what you have done, what you are doing. And illumine our minds to your precious, illumine our minds with your precious word that keeps us walking with you. So help us, God, we pray. Strengthen each and every one of us. That each day when we get up, we will be so mindful that it is you who have watched over us and that you are there with us and we are continually invited to stand and watch and see your glorious plans unfolded in our lives. So help us God. 
give us strength to be faithful. Give us strength to be faithful. That we may pass on the truth of who you are to our children, to our children's children. And we pray, God, that as we worship you, Lord, we will be enabled more and more to walk by faith. To walk by faith. Heavenly Father, you have given us a fine opportunity to gather before your throne of grace and to be reminded that you are God who is interested in every detail of our lives. So Lord, we bring to you matters that concern us. We know that they concern us. So we pray for Sabah and pray God that you graciously watch over the people. We pray, Father, that their eyes will be open to see your glory. And we join our hearts to pray, Lord, that if it pleases you, we pray that godly people may be put in place of governance and administration in the sake of Sabah. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for our young people who are preparing themselves for the examination. Please watch over them. Please grant them grace to help them prepare themselves well for the examination. Please help them remember that you are their help, you are their wisdom, you are their guide. Help them rely on you. Help them prepare themselves humbly. And we pray, Lord, if it pleases you, Lord, grant them success in the examination. Our heart goes out to our brothers and sisters who are unwell. We pray for our brother Mr. Stephen Louis. We pray for Mrs. Louis. We pray for others who are not well. Lord is go. Lord, we pray that you graciously, Lord, envelop them with your comforting presence. Help them remember that you are God who has not forgotten them. Lord, as your people whom we have gathered to worship you, we commit ourselves to you afresh this day, that we may walk aright with you, we may be found faithful by you. Hear this our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Brothers and sisters, let us stand to affirm our faith. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith, saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the quick and the name. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
let us continue to worship the Lord by bringing Him our monetary offering. Before we do so, let us pray the offertory prayer together. Dear Lord, we gladly receive all that you send our way. We thank you for your bountiful blessings beyond our counting. We like to bring to you as our offering in this our act of worship. What you have first given us, and we pray that we be pleased to receive that. Amen. Now you may come forward to put your monetary offering in the offering box under the indication and the guidance of the archers. Secondly, uh, MW Bible study will be resumed on 26th of September at 2.30 p.m. on Zoom platform. And this will be the last lesson um, of the series in this year. Um, if you have not received the notes, please check in with Evelyn Steve. For the rest of the announcement, I'm going to leave for your reading and your full participation. And in response to the word that has preached to us this morning, let us arise and join our hearts in the closing hymn, Have Thy Own Way, Lord.
Lord, we know that you love us with an everlasting and enduring love. We thank you that God, we were there when we walked through the valley of the shadow of death. God, we know that you're here and you are fully aware of the deep question that is there no one else knows you. Thank you, God, that you know us and that you love us. But there are many things that we don't know. We yield ourselves to you because we know that your ways are perfect. So please have your way in our life. For we know the day will come when you will enable us and allow us to see your glorious hands, strength and purpose in our lives. Now may the peace of God which passes over understanding guard your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ, Savior. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us now and always.